The disease with a thousand faces. Difficult to diagnose, complex and chronic. It will strike one in 900 Canadians. Lupus. This autoimmune disease alters patients' lives and if left untreated, can be fatal. At the BC Lupus Society, we provide support to people living with lupus. Because lupus is unpredictable, we strive to be dependable. Our programs include weekly support groups for patients and families in British Columbia. We make sure that educational resources and peer contacts are always available, including for patients facing a new lupus diagnosis. And every year, we help fund clinical training and medical research that benefit people with lupus. Through the BC Lupus Research Scholar Program, our goal is to advance treatments and discoveries to change the future of lupus. Our partnership with university researchers is unique in Canada and has helped understand the full impact of lupus and the effectiveness of lupus care. As part of our community, you're a valued part of annual events like our Lupus Gala and the Shed Light on Lupus Walk. These fundraising activities generate just part of the funds needed to sustain our work in patient support and medical research. With the generous support of donors like you, the BC Lupus Society will continue to be here for patients and families affected by lupus. Not only can we change tomorrow, we can brighten today. Thank you from the BC Lupus Society. Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Angela Hu. I'm a final year rheumatology fellow at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I will also be pursuing additional lupus training uh, at the University of California in San Francisco. And in addition to that, I also plan on completing a master's in science in clinical epidemiology to further not only clinical care, but also research in the field of lupus. So without further delay, I'll start by sharing my presentation. So today I'll be talking about type 1 and type 2 lupus and delving into this a little bit further. So in terms of the overview for my talk today, I'll be talking about this novel classification scheme with the type 1 and type 2 lupus, as well as understanding the causes and pathophysiology of type 2 lupus, as well as understanding clinical implications and the role of future research in this area. So we'll start off with a case. We have Ms. Y, who is a 29-year-old woman working as a legal assistant. She develops three months of joint pains, photosensitive rashes, and oral ulcers. Blood work has shown a positive anti-nuclear antibody, as well as low complements. So she's diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus and treated with hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil. So five years later, she has no rashes and her oral ulcers are infrequent. However, she still has widespread joint and body pain as well as significant fatigue. So her physician deems her disease as inactive and treatment is successful. However, Ms. Y reports that her disease is still quite severe with ongoing functional impairment and she has not been able to return to work since her diagnosis. So where does this discrepancy arise and how are we able to address this? So this is where this new classification system of type 1 and type 2 lupus comes in. So this was a novel system pioneered by David Pizetsky's group at Duke University and first described in 2019. So it is still quite recent in the lupus literature and hasn't been widely adopted yet. In this model, they propose that lupus can be divided into two broad categories, which they term type 1 and type 2. So with type 1 lupus, this is the lupus that we traditionally understand, um, where there's various different organ systems that can be involved, including the skin, the joints, kidney, lung, cardiac, neurologic, and so forth. In this picture on the right-hand side, we can see a patient with classic butterfly rash, also known as the Mailer rash, um, a cutaneous manifestation that falls in, in the realm of type 1 lupus. So in type 1 lupus, we understand that there are specific immune mechanisms that drive inflammation and that result in these specific signs and symptoms. 
So these type one uh, symptoms are well captured in our commonly used disease activity indices, such as the SLE disease activity index or the SLEDI, which is commonly used in both clinical as well as research settings. So these type one symptoms can often correlate with blood work markers, such as dropping complement levels, rising inflammation markers like CRP, as well as elevated autoimmune antibodies like the double-stranded DNA. So what about type two lupus? This includes symptoms such as fatigue, widespread body pain, depression, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, and sleep disturbance. These symptoms often tend to be chronic and are not necessarily related to conventionally defined lupus disease activity. So furthermore, these symptoms usually do not respond very well to therapy with immunosuppression or corticosteroids. Unfortunately, we know that these type 2 symptoms are often very pervasive and dominate in patient-reported outcomes and serve as poor determinants of both health status and quality of life. In patients with lupus, over 80% of patients have, been, have reported that they experience fatigue, as well as over 90% of patients reporting pain that has bothered them at some point in their disease course. So we know that these type 2 symptoms are often very prevalent in uh, systemic lupus. Unfortunately, these symptoms are not very well captured on either our diagnostic or classification criteria, as well as other disease activity and damage measures. So in this proposed construct by David Pizetsky's group, they consider these type 2 symptoms to be direct manifestations of lupus, while at the same time acknowledging that these symptoms can be a result of many different factors. So this is a distinct change from categorizing each of these symptoms as different diseases, such as lupus with major depressive disorder or fibromyalgia or chronic pain. And this is... Um, uh, this is a different way about thinking of lupus in the sense that perhaps there are some immunologic mechanisms that drive patients with lupus to have these increased uh, prevalence of type 2 symptoms, and we don't fully understand all of these mechanisms yet at this point. So what is the role of this classification system? Multiple studies have reported on the discordance between what patients view as active disease and what physicians view. And this is highlighted in that first case that I had presented at the beginning of my talk. As a result of these consequences, um, as a result of these uh, uh, discordant views between patients and physicians, that can have multiple negative sequelae. For example, patients can feel unheard and dissatisfied with care. They may also have reduced adherence to medications as they view them ineffective in treating the symptoms most bothersome to them. It can also result in missed appointments, seeking alternative care with other practitioners, as well as overtreatment with steroids and immunosuppressants, particularly in this COVID era where some of our visits, visits are conducted over telehealth. And without a full physical examination, sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between pain related to active um, uh, joint effusions or inflammation within the joints or widespread um, pain, for example. And so that can result in unnecessary treatment with some of these immune suppressing medications. So what is the cause of these type 2 symptoms? Among cytokines abnormally expressed in lupus, we know that type 1 interferon is uh, an important cytokine that has prominent effects on the nervous system. And there, in other diseases that have been historically treated with interferon therapy, such as hepatitis C or multiple sclerosis, we know the impact of interferon on the development of symptoms such as low mood and fatigue. So it's hypothesized that perhaps um, this interferon upregulation could play a role in the development um, of these type 2 symptoms in lupus. There was also a systematic review on genetic contributions of inflammation to depression published by Barnes et al. in January of 2017 that also identified other genetic polymorphisms in various different cytokines, including interleukin-1, 6, 10, and TNF that could potentially link pathways between immune activation and depression. Again, suggesting that perhaps these are not unrelated disorders, but that the interplay between immune activation may lead to other genetic polymorphisms that uh, increase the risk of depression, low mood, and so forth. So 
In delving into these type 2 symptoms a little bit further, there was a study that was very recently published on the molecular endotypes of type 1 and type 2 lupus. This was published by Robel et al., again from Duke University, in just a couple months ago in January of this year. So in the study, they had included 18 patients, uh, nine with classic type 1 symptoms and nine with classic type 2 symptoms, and they had taken their peripheral blood and analyzed their gene expression profiles. What they found was that there were specific uh, genes that were enriched, or in other words, overexpressed in type 1 versus type 2, and that these differed. So in type 1 patients, they found that um, genes that were overexpressed included pathways involving interferon, monocytes, T cells, cell cycle, and so forth. In type 2 lupus, gene pathways that were overexpressed included B cells, metabolic, and neuromuscular uh, pathways. So again, leading to the underlying hypothesis that perhaps there's um, various genetic uh, um, underlying uh, genetic factors that can lead to the dichotomy between presentations in lupus patients with predominant type 1 or predominant type 2 symptoms. So what are the clinical implications of this and how are people incorporating this into their clinical practice? So it has been suggested that perhaps physicians should be score scoring a physician global based on both type 1 and type 2 lupus manifestations. So this is shown on the left-hand side. So this helps to categorize um, patient symptoms better in the sense that, for example, a patient's arthritis or their nephritis or other rashes might be quiescent, and so they would get a score of zero for type 1 symptoms. However, they may still report ongoing fatigue or pain or these other symptoms, which then would warrant either a mild, moderate, or so forth scoring in their type 2 physician global assessment. So it helps to acknowledge these type 2 symptoms while also acknowledging that they're distinct from the other type 1 manifestations that we traditionally use immunosuppression for. There are other questionnaires, such as the Systemic Lupus Activity Questionnaire, questionnaire also known as SLAC, that somewhat help to quantify, again, type 2 symptoms, although these are not perfect by any means. So this is seen on the right-hand side, where this questionnaire does incorporate some questions such as forgetfulness, feeling depressed, headaches, muscle pain, and so forth. And again, it helps to quantify them into mild, moderate, or severe uh, severity. So there was a pilot study that actually looked at implementing type 1 and type 2 lupus model in an academic rheumatology clinic. And this was published by Amanda Udy's group at Duke University and presented at the American College of Rheumatology Conference last year. So in this study, they had patients fill out the SLAC, which was the questionnaire I showed you on the previous slide, as well as fibromyalgia scores and polysymptomatic distress scales. And the physicians did both type 1 and type 2 uh, physician global assessments. So the results that they saw post uh, incorporating some of these questionnaires included increased discussion of type 2 symptoms, increased discussion of treatments for type 2 symptoms, there was no increase in visit length, and there were also high levels of patient satisfaction. This is with the caveat that this was done in an academic center where the visit lengths were already long, so they were already at baseline 60 or 65 minutes, and so it could be said that by having already such a long visit length, it did not impact um, much in, in being able to increase the, the visit length a bit further. But overall, patients were quite satisfied. And there are some other centers in Canada as well, for example, in Manitoba, that have also started to incorporate um, uh, discussion and uh, objective documentation of type 2 symptoms within their visits. And again, anecdotally, it has been reported that patients are quite satisfied in having um, these symptoms better addressed and identified, um, uh, although there hasn't been a lot of literature published yet in our Canadian landscape. So in terms of some adjunct treatments, there have been systemic, uh, systematic reviews that have examined non-pharmacological treatments in addressing specific symptoms. And this was published by Fangham et al. in May of 2020. 
So they looked at various non-pharmacological treatments in addressing specific uh, areas, for example, fatigue, and they included multiple different randomized control trials, which did find a positive effect for the uh, benefit of exercise, uh, specifically aerobic exercise, at least 30 minutes, three times a week. Otherwise, they also looked at domains like depression and again, counseling, which could include group psychotherapy or biofeedback assisted cognitive behavioral therapy was also found to be beneficial. And they also looked at quality of life for which exercise and both counseling were helpful in improving this overall domain. So in terms of areas of future research, there are it, this still remains an area that needs to be greatly explored as it is, as I mentioned, still very early on in its infancy, both in understanding what is type 1 and type 2 lupus, as well as adoption of this, both nationally as well as internationally. Um, and so firstly, what we need to research is further uh, is better understanding the underlying genotypes and immunologic mechanisms that drive differences in type 1 and type 2 symptoms. And only through our immunologic understanding of these type 2 symptoms will we be able to develop targeted treatment therapies. As of yet, our best therapies are these adjunct non-pharmacologic therapies, such as exercise or psychological counseling, but we don't yet have any specific medications that may be able to address these type 2 symptoms. Um, that being said, there are some new medications or, or therapies that are uh, in the pipeline, for example, anifrolumab, which is a type 1 interferon, interferon receptor inhibitor. And earlier, as I described, interferon does have an important role in the pathogenesis of fatigue and low mood. And so perhaps um, some of these newer medications remain to be seen whether they might be able to also benefit type 2 symptoms. Thirdly, it will also be important to quantify the burden of type 2 symptoms amongst our BC lupus population to understand the prevalence as well as the impact of these symptoms on the patients. And in being able to better understand the, that burden, only then will we be able to collaborate with other specialties and allied health professionals, such as psychiatrists, dietitians, and physiotherapists, in being able to develop holistic approaches to the treatment of lupus. So definitely an evolving area of research that remains to be explored. So that's it for my talk today. Thank you so much for listening and to the BC Lupus Symposium for inviting me to speak. Thanks again.